Alrighty, welcome back to the Bullock everybody. So you thought that since election season was over, you were done with politics for a while. Nope, not yet. But staying clear from politics and staying with news that I guarantee will not hit your timelines, I've got number 63 the Bullock, let's do it. <music> I don't know if you can describe tensions in the Middle East anymore as news at this point, but what's going on over there right now is something we might all be looking back on five years from now going, yep, that was the point of no return. The Pentagon is urging Turkey to throw away their plans at invading Syria as there are still some US troops located in the country. If you haven't heard about this probably because your newsfeed is filled with junk like this, this, and this, Turkey's president has been threatening and at one point in May even promised to invade Syria at some point very soon. US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has expressed that airstrikes along with Turkey's impending invasion would threaten any personnel that are still in the area. The soldiers he is referring to are special operations soldiers that are bunked down in what's called Al Tamf Garrison, which is a very small base that was created in 2016 when fighting ISIS became a top priority for the United States. The base was strategically positioned inside of Syria and along the borders of Iraq and Jordan, right alongside the M2 Baghdad Damascus Highway. The United States still being over there shows that we still want to have a say on what goes on in Syria's future. What is so important at having control of the M2 highway is supply lines. For Iran, for example, the highway is imperative in its own supply chain because the highway goes through Iraq, through Syria, and eventually to Lebanon. The United States interest has always been to own that channel of real estate and operate it with US backed Sunni and Kurdish forces, thus disrupting the supply line significantly and making countries that want to use it, such as Iran, to have to bow to the US if they want to use it. Also a reason why Iran has a heavy interest in the area as well. Now to better understand Turkey's potential invasion, you need to know who the major players are, and it's ironic because each party has their own backed forces in the region. So remember, it's not necessarily all of their own troops on the ground. To put it simply, there are four main parties involved here. You have the US, Russia, Iran, Israel, and now potentially a fifth heavy presence, which involves Turkey. So Iran, has their own backed forces like the United States does with the Kurds, all while Israel has been consistently firing upon Iran's backed forces in Syria. This is where the US puts itself at risk. Israel has been using the airspace over the US base of Garrison as it limits Israel's risk of being shot down by Syria's defense missiles, which are located on the other side of the country because Israel is friendly with the US. However, by the US allowing Israel to use this airspace over the years, it's opened the US base to retaliatory attacks, AKA back on August 14th of 2022 this year, if you remember, Israel struck its Iran's targets in Syria by using US air quarters. And then just so happens exactly one day later, an Iran backed missile hit the US base as a retaliatory measure. Now, Russia's role in Syria since 2011 was to originally support the president of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, with military aid and providing a political backing. Now, Russia's role in the region is anyone's best guess, as their invasion of Ukraine is causing them to use more military resources there rather than in Syria. So let me summarize real quick. Basically, Israel is there to prevent Iran from growing its influence throughout Syria. The US is there to have a presence and a say in Syria's future and to stop the growth of terrorism. Iran is there to help their own supply lines and because they are allies with Syria ever since they realized both them and Syria both shared their own common dislike towards both Israel and the US. 
And finally, Russia used to be there to provide military aid to the Syrian government, but of course that could change at any moment because of Ukraine. Now, if you look at it from a bird's eye view, it sort of sounds like the smallest little world war, right? I can better sell it to you this way. You got four countries right now from three different continents that are located in 19 different time zones using their own subcontracted forces to fight each other. Now let's bring on Turkey. Turkey is about to come in with some fresh blood. A bombing on November 13th of this year that resulted in six people being killed and wounding 81 others in the city of Istanbul, the Turkish government has pinned the blame on Kurdish forces for carrying out the attack in their city even though no group claimed responsibility for it yet. Turkey's main focus for targeting Kurdish forces is because of historical tensions and the Kurds attempting to claim their own independence from Turkey in the southeast region of the country. Now remember, the Kurdish groups are the forces the U.S. backs in Syria. You see how this starts to get a little bit dicey? With historical tensions between Turkey and the Kurdish groups already brewing, the bombing and Turkey's quick to blame them has escalated Turkey to start planning a mobilization into Syria and making and I'm quoting now the spokesperson for the Turkish presidency in a recent interview last week with Al Jazeera here. The Kurdish forces being legitimate targets. Quoting again from a different interview that the actual Turkish president had, they are legitimate targets because they are terrorist groups. We go after them to protect our borders. Kurdish forces are America's main ally in Syria. So it will get very complicated if Turkey and the Kurds start fighting each other. A huge red flag for the United States here. A reason to heavily oppose Turkey's invasion is the Kurdish forces in Syria currently operate and control about 24 different prisons throughout Syria that hold about 10,000 male ISIS fighters. 10 freaking thousand. In late May, Turkey's very emboldened president Erdogan said, we'll come down on them one night and we must, talking about the Kurds. Now from this, it's hard not to see how Turkey isn't going to invade as the biggest power in the region being the US only has a few hundred troops left in the region and Russia's not looking too hot either. If and when they do invade, the U.S. will have a very difficult choice to make as the U.S.-backed Kurds will inevitably be directly fighting Turkish forces. So if you're the U.S., do you help them fight Turkey and bring on another full war for yourself? Or do you leave them to fight for themselves and most likely lose your closest ally in the region and also leave the potential collapse of the prison system that currently holds 10,000 ISIS troops ready to regain their freedom and spread all over Europe and the US again and come shoot up the nearest Starbucks near you. I don't know what to do. Tough choice. I mean, what would you do? Most importantly here, if you haven't heard anything about this yet, you should ask yourself why. Why haven't you heard any of this insanity that could flip the entire world on its head overnight? As always, I never get these stories from just one source as it comes from analyzing a multitude of different online news organizations that, as we all know, are extremely biased today in the reporting, which is why I put the information from all of these sides into basically a Venn diagram and take from what just falls in the middle. Get some good overlap. Now, if you haven't heard about this story, I guarantee that you haven't heard any of these either. Heading into the intro here and then jumping right into silent stories in 60 seconds. Let's do it. No one is talking about this. So why isn't it getting national attention as well? If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed.
Silent stories in 60 seconds here over to Spain where three men cling to the rudder of an oil tanker while the ship was on its way back from Nigeria. All three survived despite serious dehydration and hypothermia and were all from Nigeria. The distance they survived was roughly 2,800 miles at sea over the course of 11 days. That's brutal. Over to Indonesia as a 5.6 magnitude earthquake killed at least 162 people as it decimated the country's main island of Java. It wasn't just the earthquake to blame for all of these deaths though, it never is. It's usually what the earthquake causes, which in this case was major landslides and the collapse of entire buildings. Now this critically endangered Balkan lynx in southeastern Albania made an appearance on a path in the Balkans that was captured on a trail cam you can see here. Why this is so cool and rare is that it's estimated there are only 40 that remain in the Balkans and less than 10 of them are still located in Albania alone. So amazing capture. To be categorized as critically endangered, by the way, means the population has declined by 90% and only 10 are still in that area. So that's amazing. Now, if you've watched this show before each week, you know where we're going. To a developing story out of Chicago where police now say 14 people were shot. Shots fired 147 Maple Street. Requesting backup. All units, stand by. All right. Another weekend in the books, which means another unfortunate weekend in Chicago as we have 17 people shot in total by the end of the weekend, with four being fatal with the age ranges being between 18 and 36 years old. And this is in comparison to the worst weekend of the year for Chicago, which was back on July 4th. And now it's time for crown of the week. Let's do it. Crown of the week going over to Georgia to honor Casper, one badass sheepdog who has been the eyes and ears of the John Willers farm, protecting the farm and its livestock from being preyed on by the area's predators. Recently, the farm's herd came under attack by 12 coyotes looking to make a kill and Casper came right along to the rescue. Casper not only saved the entire herd, but killed eight of the 12 coyotes by himself. <laughs> this dog is literally Rambo in dog form. It did not come without injury though, as Casper had part of his tail ripped off and had wounds all over his body. Casper, we salute you. And now on to journalist George. George, thanks for again for being on with us today. What do you have for us? Hi, Dan. So have you ever heard of the coffee giant Starbucks? Yes, I have, George. I've heard of Starbucks. Well, they are rolling out a new tipping system that has really gotten some of their own customers very upset. So on top of already rising coffee prices, Starbucks is adding an option to add a tip that people are required to either give a specific tip like one or two dollars, a custom tip, or enter no tip at all. It's leaving some people with very awkward scenarios that has both the customer and the Starbucks employee complaining. Yeah, I can see why. I mean, with tips that go on a credit card as well, don't those tips get taxed too? And on say like a $5 coffee, you're at most getting like, what, a $1 tip? And then you take federal, state, and city taxes and you're making about 45 cents and then take out the processing fee as well because it's used on a credit card and you're at what, like 35 cents? Yep, that sounds about right. I guess that's worth the awkwardness of asking the customer if they would like to tip. Well, I don't really understand all the hype about tipping anyway. I mean, 
how tipping went from going over the top, providing amazing Very true. Very service, true. to now even cashiers asking for them. I was at a pizza place the other day, grabbing a slice, and the checkout screen for my $4 slice had a suggested tip amount on it to complete. And it was for it to go order. Why would I leave a tip for it to go order for one slice of pizza? I can understand if I'm sitting down, but isn't that the whole reason that some restaurants have shared tips for the staff? No, believe me, I get it, man. I mean, I've been there. It's, it's only a matter of time until you're at Staples or CVS or Walmart and there's a tip option there too. How would you suggest someone handles themselves in that scenario with Starbucks though, George? Hmm, let me think. Hmm, I would say just be honest. Say you can't afford to tip them, even though, you know, you're spending $5 on coffee. Ha <laughs> I'm sure they'll understand. <laughs> uh, always some good insight from you, George. I'll see, <laughs> I'll see you next week, man. <laughs> uh, yep. Goodbye, Daniel. Now, I have some good podcasts in the brewing, but in the meantime, guys, look out for a video coming out this Friday at 4.30 p.m. that I guarantee will restore your faith in humanity. It's a compilation of the best live crowd sing-along moments taken from a variety of different events that involve concerts, sporting events, and even a bar that does live group singing. Sort of like a reverse karaoke, if that makes any sense. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment on which one was your favorite story, and I will see you then.